This is a thrilling feedback. <laughs> this is a thrilling section of the book of Daniel. All this week, I, I would get up from uh, my table, my desk, wherever I found myself uh, with this passage open and just thankful. Thankful that the world that we experience now is not the way it will always be. Uh, eagerly anticipating the reign of Christ. I found myself repeating over and over again this week, Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. We find Daniel and his friends having been taken captive as teens, dragged off to a foreign land at the mercy of a despot, facing the potential of doubt about God's promises, God's identity, God's power, and they have been lined up for execution for the crime of not being able to accomplish the impossible. And how does it turn out? Spoiler alert, uh, Daniel chapter 2 tells us, uh, specifically verses 48 and 49, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. And they have gone from slave captives of a tyrannical despot to powerful, wealthy rulers in the land, all before the age of 20. We love a good rags-to-riches story, you know, or little orphan Annie, finally makes her way in the world. Uh, maybe you're uh, more uh, in line with Cinderella. For me personally, it was Cinderella Man. That's my rags to riches story. The boxer who finally made it. We love the story of the protagonist who begins in a humble state, who suffers, who's mistreated, but in the end, the hero wins. The protagonist is vindicated and the antagonists are humiliated. But that's not what this story is about. Daniel and his friends are not the main characters. This is not a rags-to-riches story of poor Jewish slaves hauled off to Babylon. The main character of this section of Scripture, though unnamed, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the point of this passage is that His kingdom is coming, and it will put an end to all the ages of corrupt rule of man on the earth. Nebuchadnezzar and we will come face to face with the reality that the God of heaven is the kingmaker. He truly is king of all kings and lord of all lords, and he is exercising his sovereign will in the rise and fall of empires, all of it revealed to the king of Babylon in a frightening dream of a metalloid statue. We get to look in on Nebuchadnezzar's dream and its interpretation this evening through Daniel chapter 2. The point of the passage from verse 36 down to the end of the chapter is simply Daniel delivers the interpretation of the king's dream. We're going to look at this section in two parts, the interpretation of the dream and then the king's response. And just fair warning, most of our time tonight we'll dive into the interpretation of the dream. The king's response will get a small mention at the end. What does this dream mean? We've all been waiting with bated breath for Daniel to tell King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was all about. The dream means that God will establish his eternal kingdom and bring an end to all human government, all corrupt, sinful human government. Look at verse 36. This was the dream, Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. And you remember this dream. Nebuchadnezzar had gone to bed at night wondering what was going to happen after him, what was going to come of his life and the future of the empire. And when he went to sleep, God gave him a disturbing, unrelenting vision of the future that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't shake. It wasn't like any normal dream you wake up from and you do something else with your life and you move on. Nebuchadnezzar could not move on from this dream because it was from Yahweh. Yahweh wanted to disturb Nebuchadnezzar and so reveal his plans, not only to Nebuchadnezzar and to the Babylonian Empire, but to Jewish captives, a Jewish nation in exile, and even to us today. 
By the way, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is concurrent with our own time. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is very relevant to where we find ourselves in history today. And you remember in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that there was this great big statue. And it was a statue of a man. It was in the form of a man standing before Nebuchadnezzar in various shades of metals from gold to silver to bronze to iron to iron mixed with clay. And this statue stood before Nebuchadnezzar in his dream and terrified the king. And then you remember that the statue was smoked, smitten. It had been smited. Whatever the past participle of smite is, that's what happened to the statue when a stone came and pulverized it to smithereens. This man, the form of a man standing as a statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream stands for four empires. Four empires that expanded beyond their own territories to conquer the known world. Those four empires are described here in Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Not, they're not named here in Daniel 2, but there is no mistaking what these empires are. So the names of the empires are going to form the outline under the meaning of this dream. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is given here in four kingdoms, and we're going to detail those four kingdoms. We'll eventually come to a fifth. But these first four, four kingdoms, four empires that expanded beyond their own territories to conquer other lands to be empires, not merely kingdoms in a regional sense. We'll detail the descriptions of these first four individually, and then we'll walk through kind of what the picture of these four is together. The first kingdom, the first bit of the image is Babylon. Look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Very clearly here, Daniel has identified the top of the statue as Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and he stands for the Babylonian Empire. And there are two statements here about the the top and about Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel says, you are the king of kings, and you are the head of gold. And in between those two statements, we'll find some more material. But first of all, thinking about Nebuchadnezzar, he stands for Babylon. He is its king and its embodiment. It was Nebuchadnezzar that made Babylon mighty in its heyday. 43 of the 66 years of the Neo-Babylonian Empire were Nebuchadnezzar's reign from 603 to 539 BC. He made Babylon great again. Truly, he was the embodiment of all that was great of the Babylonian Empire. And so Daniel says to him, you, O king, are the king of kings. This, by the way, is not flattery. This is a revealed fact from God who gave the vision and the interpretation. The statement here of Nebuchadnezzar being the king of kings is a superlative statement. Of all the kings that could be named, Nebuchadnezzar is at the top, and this is God's assessment of him. God is not speaking here of Nebuchadnezzar's moral character or his godliness, but of his regal ability, his skill as a monarch. Interestingly, Ezekiel says the same thing about Nebuchadnezzar in Ezekiel 26.7, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will bring upon Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses, chariots, cavalry, and a great army. It's not merely a statement that Nebuchadnezzar was a king who ruled over other kings. This is a unique statement with a definiteness that describes a superlative nature to Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And then it closes with the statement, you are the head of gold in verse 38. You remember from the dream, the top of the statue was made of gold. It was made of fine gold, a purity of a precious material, the most valuable material. That was to say that Nebuchadnezzar was a rare monarch whose abilities and energy fit his occupation. He was well suited to the job. And you consider the splendor of ancient Babylon. It really was a a wonder in the ancient world. It was the center of learning. The hanging gardens were considered uh, one of the world's ancient wonders. 
Babylon's architecture and its palaces, its temples were resplendent in beauty and design. And the empire that radiated out from the city of Babylon was characterized by magnificence and grandeur and glory. Successive generations and successive empires wrote about it, looking back at the greatness of Babylon. And what's fascinating in this passage is not that Nebuchadnezzar is declared to be the best king ever, but that he is told why. The original text here has, a, has an important word that does not show up in the New American Standard, and it is the word for or because right after the statement, you, O king, are the king of kings. It should read there, because the God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and the strength and the glory to you. Why is Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold? Why is he called by God the king of kings? Because God gave him the kingdom. This is such a critical word. The theme of Daniel is wrapped up in this critical word that doesn't get translated. King of kings and head of gold bracket the theology behind his kingship. Specifically, the God of heaven gave the kingdom to you. The kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. This is staggering. And Nebuchadnezzar would go on later in this very book and say, is this not Babylon the great that I have made with my own hand? And right here, Daniel is interpreting the dream for Nebuchadnezzar and said, not so fast. You are the king of kings and the head of gold because God gave it to you. He is completely and totally dependent on the God he has not acknowledged. And notice verse 38. Wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, God has given them into your hand and then God has caused you to rule. Three times in a very short span, God gets the credit for Nebuchadnezzar's reign, for his glory, for his majesty, for the beauty and power of the Babylonian empire. And this phrasing is so interesting. Wherever the sons of men dwell, God's given you that realm to rule. Wherever the beasts of the field are, God has given you that place to rule. And wherever the birds of the sky are, he's given you that place to rule. He's given them all into your hand and he's caused you to rule over them all. This is really interesting set of phrases here. The beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. What's missing? the fish of the sea, right? If we're, if we're familiar with Genesis 1 and Psalm 8, we're expecting this fish of the sea, and apparently Nebuchadnezzar was not a fisherman nor a recreational diver. Maybe he was afraid of sharks. Um, he stuck, stuck to the land and the, and the sky animals. But everywhere that Nebuchadnezzar had his hand of rule, he was uh, a sub-regent under God for the things on the earth. Nebuchadnezzar had conquered a lot of things and the territory he controlled was given this feel of rulership and lordship over all. Now listen to Genesis 128. God blessed them, and the only them on the earth there at that point is Adam and Eve. And God said to them, man and woman made in his image, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And if you read Psalm 8, which is a commentary on Genesis 1, and you read Hebrews 2, you, you understand that the rulership that God has given to man is the emblem of what man should be, but isn't because of sin. Man's failure to live up to his fundamental purpose, to fill the earth, fill God's created order as God's subregion on the earth, ruling the created order, subduing it, filling it. Humanity was designed by God for lordship, for kingdom, for power, for strength, and for glory. And as the Bible unfolds, we see humanity fail miserably at its fundamental purpose. Glorify God on the earth, bear his stamp or his image, labor to represent God's purpose and character and manifold witness on the earth. Only one man got it right, the God-man, the image of God in man, the Lord Jesus Christ. As king, he rules with goodness and with love, glorifying his father at all times, humbly serving those he governs. His is a rulership of selfless love. The sinful man always gets it wrong. Either abdicating or abusive, lazy or lording it over others, a couch potato or a me monster. Man gets this lordship thing wrong because of sin. 
We take credit instead of giving glory. We serve self instead of serving others. We like the title, the riches, the leverage of power, but not the responsibility for the welfare of others. Whatever lordship we exercise is contaminated, ruined by sin. We ought to be struck by the words that are used here of Nebuchadnezzar. As a king on the earth, he is actually being given language that was due the sub-regent role of man on the earth, to be lords of the earth, to be sub-regents under God's kingship in the created order. So Daniel closes this statement of Nebuchadnezzar with, you are the head of gold. That is, Nebuchadnezzar is in rare air. He is a rare commodity. It's an uncommon gathering of gifting paired with tireless commitment. We read from history Nebuchadnezzar's tireless efforts to build Babylon, to make it beautiful, to make it great, and to manage and exercise um, good kingship. I don't mean that in a moral sense. I mean effective sovereignty over a vast empire. Uh, It it has been said by some historians that the Neo-Babylonian Empire invented empires. This really is the first age of kings going way beyond their borders and establishing a manageable rulership over broad territories and multiple peoples. He had perhaps what Kobe Bryant called a mamba mentality. You think about a Michael Jordan at the top of his game with natural skill plus hard work plus that extra competitive something sort of a cutthroat approach, whatever it takes to be the goat. Why are you, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold? Because the God of heaven, whom you do not acknowledge, whom you offend with your immoralities, and whose condemnation you incur by your idolatries, has given you everything that you have. Whatever skills, whatever strength, whatever opportunities and circumstances and successes, the God of heaven made man, the God of heaven made every man, the God of heaven made you, Nebuchadnezzar. To be told that you are the goat, the greatest of all time, would be an ego trip. But to be told that someone else gets all the credit for it should be humbling. And we will see how Nebuchadnezzar responds to that statement. Nebuchadnezzar, as head of the Babylonian Empire, is the first kingdom. He's the head of gold in the statue. Next, in verse 39, we move to Medo-Persia. This is the second empire in the list. Look at verse 39. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. That's all that Medo-Persia gets here. How do we know it's Medo-Persia? It's not in the text. It will be. First, let's start with just the phrase, after you. Think about being in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes, and all the sycophants around him have said, O king, live forever. And God says, after you. (laughs) You're coming to an end. Um, You're going to die. You're going to go away. You're going to be buried. And and even the empire that you strove to make great will crumble behind you. It all ends. There is another kingdom coming. Coming. And that another kingdom is inferior. Literally, the word, it is earthward from you. So Nebuchadnezzar's here. The next kingdom is lower. Look down towards the ground. We remember from the dream that the chest and arms are of silver. Verse 32. Uh, This is the Medo-Persian Empire, 539 B.C. to 331 B.C., approximately 208 years long. How do we know it's Medo-Persia? Well, it's not named here, but in chapter 5, verse 28, we find out that Babylon is handed over to the Medes and the Persians. And then over in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, very specifically names Darius the Mede and three more kings of Persia over this empire. The four metals in the Daniel 2 dream correspond to the four beasts in the vision of Daniel chapter 7. We'll get there. And then those four beasts are identified as four successive kingdoms, and they are named in Daniel 7 and 8. The second kingdom in that vision is a bear, and in chapter 8, that second kingdom is a two-horned ram. And in chapter 8, verse 20, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia very clearly named in the book of Daniel. I want you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 21. 
because this second empire gets named a long time before Nebuchadnezzar's dream. A long time before Daniel wrote, before he was exiled. Isaiah 21, 1 to 10 is God's judgment, future judgment against Babylon. Now at this point, Babylon has not yet been God's tool to judge Israel and take Israel into exile. But God is already prophesying that, ba- uh, that Babylon will be judged for her many crimes. And in verse 2 specifically, a harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously. The destroyer still destroys. Go up, Elam, lay siege, Media. I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused. Now, this is uh, a reference to the destruction of Babylon by the Median Empire. That is the Medo-Persians. We come down to verse 9 of Isaiah 21. Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. So Isaiah predicted that this would happen. Nebuchadnezzar's vision puts on display that the kingdom following his would be the Medo-Persians. In Daniel chapter 5, the handwriting was on the wall. Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, is slain, and Darius the Mede receives the kingdom. The Babylonian Empire comes to an end. So even though Daniel 2 doesn't tell us it's the Medes and the Persians, the rest of the book of Daniel does tell us that. The third kingdom is Greece, second half of verse 39. Daniel relates, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule all the earth. So this third kingdom is coming. And as you make your way down the statue of metal, we've gone from gold to silver, now we're at bronze, and this one is Greece. Daniel 8.21 and 11.2 both name this kingdom as Greece. The empire of Greece lasted from 331 to 146 BC, about 185 years. And the key figure in the Grecian empire was Alexander the Great. And in his short tenure, he conquered everything from Egypt and Europe all the way to India with remarkable speed and with brilliant tactics. We're going to see a lot more of Alexander the Great and everything that he does that Daniel describes long before he lived when we get to the last half of the book of Daniel. The fourth empire, beginning in verse 40, is Rome. Rome is not named, but let's look at the details here. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, Daniel says, as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. There will be a fourth kingdom. This is the Roman Empire, which began in 146 BC at the defeat of Carthage, which is the end of the Grecian Empire, beginning of the Roman Empire. And if you were to somehow identify the end of the Roman Empire, you you can put that in any number of places in world history, Uh, either the division of Eastern and Western Empire of Rome in 395 AD, that would give a duration of 500 years to the Roman Empire. Uh, You could calculate it by the last uh, last emperor in the Western side of the empire in 476 AD. Um, Or you could look at the whole political religious complex that eventually became the Roman Catholic Church as a continuation of the Roman Empire. Any way you put it, this empire has far exceeded in territory and in duration the empire's proceeding. And it is described as as strong as iron by Daniel. And and there's not a commentator on Daniel who disagrees with identifying this as Rome, even though Rome is not named. Uh, Rome is never named in the book of Daniel. Uh, The Roman Empire is uh, not even a twinkle in the eye of world politics at this point. 
and, and yet the descriptions of Rome um, and then the naming of Rome in the New Testament will clarify things for us. The, the only detractors to seeing this empire as Rome are those who will disallow Daniel to be prophetic. There are those who believe that Daniel wrote, not as a prophet, but a pseudo-Daniel wrote somewhere in the second century BC during the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Um, and the goal was to get Jewish loyalties ginned up against their oppressors. And so they had to see all the enemies of Israel as those that had been cataloged and prophesied, but Daniel was really writing in the time of when it was happening. Well, concurrent to that only takes you through the Grecian Empire. So there are liberal scholars today who deny Daniel's authenticity in the 6th century BC, who will not allow that God can speak prophetically and tell the future in his book, who say, Daniel wrote after the fact. It's so accurate especially Daniel's descriptions of Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire, is so accurate that he had to have written after the fact. And so then they take their four empires up to Babylon, uh, Persia, the Medes, or the Medes, then the Persians, then the Greeks, or Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek one, Greek two. But, it, but of all the commentators who believe the Bible at face value and believe that Daniel did write prophetically, uh, the universal assessment is he is clearly speaking about Rome. This clearly fits the history of Rome. It fits Rome's self-description. The Romans are clearly the next empire, taking the mantle decisively from the Greeks in 146 BC. And then when you come to the New Testament, Luke 2 verse 1 says this, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And here again you have the exchange of empires, one empire ruling the known earth and the next one coming, ruling and taxing the known world, is the Roman Empire, present in Jesus' day. Look at verse 40. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, this empire will crush and break all these in pieces. Break all previous empires. Literally causing them to be shattered and shattering them. Rome would trample under its iron boots everything in its path. It was not enough for Rome just to win a battle, but Rome sought to crush and humiliate its victims. In fact, Rome was famous for holding its empire together by brute strength. For some 500 years, the Roman Empire was unopposable. Notice the change in Rome between verse 40 and 41. Verse 41, in that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. It will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. So the, the legs of the statue were iron, through and through. That is the beginning of Rome. But Rome undergoes some evolution, some change, some development. And, and the development is not more iron, but a mixture partly iron, partly clay. And, and the clay here is miry clay or wet clay or pottery clay, so that when it's wet, it sort of sticks to the iron, eh, but not really very well. It doesn't hold everything together very well. It's not super glue. And then when it's dry, it's brittle. So the iron is still strong in there, and the iron boot can crush, but there is an inherent vulnerability in this mixing. It doesn't stick well or long with the iron, and there is a susceptibility for division. Notice verse 43, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. I skipped verse 42, I'm so sorry. The toes of the feet were partly iron and partly pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and some of it will be brittle. And then in verse 30, 43, we see that Rome is quite literally mixing for itself, but will not mix. This thing will not be adhering to this thing. And so the Roman way of expansion of empires, as it spread across continents, meant that it mixed with other ways of doing things, other worldviews, other religious systems, other nationalities, other languages, other loyalties and commitments, other peoples. 
Rome was able to dominate those other cultures, but it never had success in assimilating them. You think about the ancient Roman outposts. You have a city like Philippi that was called a little Rome. It was a Rome far away from Rome. It was within the borders of the Roman Empire. It was within the the reaches and the military might and the, the dominating force of Rome, but it was an isolated outpost where Roman culture and Roman values and Roman jurisprudence and Roman ways of doing things all took place. But outside of little colonial outposts like that, The Roman Empire was uh, manifestly other peoples that had been dominated and made subservient to the empire. Rome goes further. We might call this section Rome 2.0 in verse 44. In the days of those kings, Daniel says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never go away. In the days of those kings. What are the those kings? He, he's clearly here not referring to the kings that have come through in the vision. Um, only Nebuchadnezzar is named there. The, the those kings, the nearest possible referent to it, is to the iron toes of verses 42 and 43. In the days of those kings, and here Daniel has changed from the metaphor to the reality, ten toes to those kings. That's just clarified for us in Daniel chapter 7, where the beast vision that matches the statue vision, and the statue you've got the four metals in descending order. In Daniel 7, you have the four beasts described in different ways. They all match those same four kingdoms. And the fourth kingdom has ten horns, and those 10 horns are said to be 10 kings. And this is confirmed for us in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And so these 10 kings are kings that didn't exist in the Rome we've seen yet so far, which is why many commentators will place verse 44 as a revived Roman Empire. If the Roman Empire that is talked about here seems to have gone off the scene of history in some fashion. God here is describing 10 toes of that final makeup of the statue, or 10 horns of the fourth beast we'll get to in chapter seven, which translate to 10 kings of yet future time in Revelation 13 and 17. These 10 toes of Daniel 2, a a federation of 10 kingdoms, We will see them allied with Antichrist in the last manifestation of the fourth kingdom. It will be the final iteration of man-made government foisted against the God of heaven. And notice what Daniel 2 says about them. The, The toes, some of iron, some of pottery, so that some will be strong and some will be brittle. That tells us something of the nature of that federation of powers that is to come. There will be strength mixed with a fragility. And we'll come to the significance of that in a little bit. What it tells us about the later stages of Rome, the the legs, the thighs are all iron. But subsequent to that, you have mixed materials. And then down at the toes, some toes iron and some toes clay. This means that eventually, clearly, Rome becomes a mixed peoples, a melting pot where the separate ingredients have not really melted. You know, it's like when you're making chocolate chip cookies and you really, you just can't wait for the cookie. I really prefer the cookie dough to the finished product of the cookies until it's the last one. And my household knows I only want the last cookie. And because if it disappears, I can say, I didn't get any. Everybody feels bad. But I really like the cookie dough the best. And if you're really anxious to get the cookie dough, and, and it hasn't mixed together well. You didn't soften the butter, and so you get you know, a, a lump of butter in there, and you got clumps of sugar together, and egg yolk strings this way and that, and you get a nice pocket of baking soda on your tongue. That's the Roman Empire. It didn't mix. It didn't assimilate together into a nice chocolate chip cookie. And we'll get more details on these four empires when we get to the last half of the book of Daniel. But now that we've looked at the details of each of the empires, let's make some observations of the four together as they're described here in this interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Most attention is given to the first and the fourth, to Nebuchadnezzar 
and then to Rome. Um, and there's more details of the intervening empires for a different audience in chapters 7 to 12. This right here is written to Nebuchadnezzar. What is my dream all about? What does God want Nebuchadnezzar to know? Um, your empire is going away, and another one's going to crush all empires and be irreplaceable. That's what Nebuchadnezzar gets. Notice the descending order of the precious material. Uh, decreasing in value as we go down from gold to silver to bronze to iron. By the way, this just uh, indicates something contrary to the way sociologists think about human development, right? There's an evolution of governmental systems and it's just getting better and better and better. Um, we've lived in a pretty remarkable experiment. Um, Winston Churchill said Western style democracies are the worst form of government ever invented by man, except for all those other forms of government ever invented by man. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we've lived in a pretty unique time that we really rather have enjoyed. And yet in the, in the big scheme of things, man's not improving. There's not an evolution of things to better and better. And by the way, the end of democratic uh, experiments, the end of republics is what? Tyranny. <laughs> At least historically, it's always happened that way. Um, the, our little experiment here will not stand the test of time. The, the thought that man could, on his own strength, on his own merit, with his own designs, with his own political experiment, experimentation, create an evolving progress of governmental systems unto a new world order and a utopia has been the dream of every beauty pageant and the promise of every politician. But it is a vain and empty promise. What it misses is the key ingredient that is the problem of human governance the human part. Post three, post Genesis three, post fall, total depravity, collective total depravity of man. The first one on the list is gold, that's Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. Um, I think what's in mind here is the descent from a pure monarchy to other forms of government. And I wanna trace this out uh, just a little bit. In Nebuchadnezzar's reign, you had a pure monarchy, an absolute sovereign. His word went. That was it. That's just what happened. When you get to the second level, the silver level, that's the Medo-Persians. First of all, you're starting with two kingdoms. Uh, you've got multiple people at the helm. It's less purely a, mo a monarchy. And then when you get to the statements in the book of Daniel in two places in chapter 6 that refers to the laws of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be revoked. And you're thinking, Darius, why don't you, I mean, you don't want Daniel in the lion's den and you're sleepless all night. You're the king, why don't you just let him out? Well, the laws of the Medes and the Persians won't let him out. What's going on there? He's not an absolute monarch. It's not his word goes. No matter his good intentions, at some level he is enslaved to something that competes for power with the monarch. The government commissioners and satraps tell the king what to do, and then the king is bound by this tradition of the laws of the king, laws of the Medes and the Persians. You get to the third level, the bronze level, that's Greece, and Greece was a republic. I can read Plato. This is where we get the idea. John Wayne said, republic, I like the sound of the word. It means people can live free, talk free, go or come, buy or sell, be drunk or sober, however they choose. He got all emotional about a republic. He was speaking about Texas. And Greece was set up as a republic. That is, there is some form of representation of the people and a senate which was to be the, the governance of the nation of Greece. Now, we know that Alexander the Great was a, a great man, a military leader. He became the central leader of Greece, but he was held sway by the representation of the people. This is a farther descent from a pure monarchy. You go gold, silver, bronze, and then iron. This is Rome. And Rome began as a Grecian-style republic. Eventually, it was a senate in name only, emperor in charge kind of uh, rulership. But there was also a bureaucracy and a nobility class, and really behind the Roman Empire, the iron, if you will, was the military-industrial complex. They really ran the show. 
In fact, it was the Roman legions and even the Praetorian Guard who could depose an emperor and they could install their own guy. Rather than the divine right of kings by hereditary descent of the Roman Empire, you had takeover by military coup, generation after generation after generation in Rome. Military strength, but a fragile unity emerged because Rome was increasingly divided. The iron and clay era of Rome is mixed nationalities, divided loyalties and interests, a variety of backgrounds, military strength, the iron boot, but no cohesion between the parts. Under Roman rule, ironically, it was the Greek language that was the common language spoken through the empire. The Roman colonies, the outposts of Roman culture were there, uh, but they were anomalies in the whole scope of the empire. The military presence really sewed the empire together from the British Isles to North Africa to Portugal to Asia. A vast empire with a vast multitude of peoples. We can think by illustration of the United States in our present day. The United States is one entity, but there is a fragile strength to our country in our day. Nationalism and patriotism have become bad words. Borders are immoral. Everything is polarized. Our fractures are increasingly visible. Listen, Texas used to joke about secession. I don't know if they're joking anymore. And lots of people on the left and the right are talking about it openly. Rome 1.0 was not conquered by a superior army. Like they were overrun by bands of raiders, the Goths, the Visigoths, and the Vandals. They sacked Rome in the 5th century, not because uh, they were stronger than all of Rome's armies, but because Rome was dissolving from the inside and couldn't hold her fractured empire together any longer. Rome 2.0 will have a similar character. Notice again the toes in verse 42, partly clay, partly iron. It will be a federation of 10 kingdoms with various characters and and they will not coalesce. There will not be cohesion into one material. It will not be a nice chocolate chip cookie. It will be separate ingredients trying to get along for a common purpose under one tyrant. Notice the descending order of the metals. While they go from greater value to lesser value, they descend in increasing strength. The gold, silver, bronze, iron, if you know the periodic table, you're going to lower atomic weights as you go down. Less valuable, but stronger. Military might and increasing territory as you go down. The idea of per, the Medes and the Persians being better than the Babylonians or the, or the Greeks being better than the Persians uh, in terms of territory, but not in terms of the purity of its rulership. Uh, that's why you go from more valuable materials up top to less valuable as you go down. That says something to us about God's ideal. God's ideal, frankly, is an absolute monarch. God's ideal is an absolute monarch, and that's hard to hear in, for us, what used to be a constitutional republic. That's hard for us. We, we love freedoms. We, we, we don't like the idea of a despot just having his way. Look, I know my own sin enough to know that you put me in charge of that. I'm going to ruin everybody's life. It's nice to spread the depravity around a little bit and have some checks and balances. But God's ideal is not that. God's ideal is a monarch with absolute power and an absolute monarch who is absolutely good. What would that government be like? Well, that leads us to the fifth empire, verses 44 and 45. And we are going to read these glorious words. Look down at the text with me. In the days of those kings those ten toes. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, literally, will never demolish itself by internal corruption. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. There's no after you another empire. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true 
and its interpretation is trustworthy. We're gonna develop this aspect of the dream next week. This is Messiah's kingdom, and it's coming. It hasn't done yet what it is said to do in this text. And we're gonna unfold that next Sunday evening. 2nd half of verse 45 just affirms that God made this dream known. God made this interpretation known. It is therefore trustworthy. The God of heaven made this known to Nebuchadnezzar and gave the interpretation to Daniel. The God who transcends everything Nebuchadnezzar could hope in, he's over everything that Nebuchadnezzar believed in. And when God speaks, his words are reliable. This is a contrast to all the learning and all the speaking of sinful men. And I just love this. Two little verses. Simple, clear words that bring an end to all the corruption of all the human governance stacked up over human history. It's interesting to me that the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw was in the form of a man. That is, man has his day. Well, the Lord is going to have his day. And that day of the Lord is a series of events that will bring to the end all of man's doings. What is the response of the king? Verses 46 to 49, temporary humility. Temporary humility. First of all, we see in verse 46 that a king of kings bows before a slave captive from a slave nation. This is a great reversal King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel, gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Listen, kings don't bow before captives. And this king, who is about to exterminate all of his trained wise men, now bows before this young Daniel. And he does more than bow. Nebuchadnezzar got religious here. Did homage is a religious word used overwhelmingly that way in the worship of a deity. He presents offerings, another religious term. He presents fragrant incense or a tranquilizing, pleasant odor before Daniel that was offered to deities in worship. Daniel here, before Nebuchadnezzar, is the visible representation of Daniel's God. What else does, da- what else does Nebuchadnezzar know to do but bow down before images of things? Daniel has spent all this time deflecting (laughs) time and again, and Nebuchadnezzar has only Daniel to look at. He is directing his own heart now at Daniel to recognize the work of Daniel's God. Look what Nebuchadnezzar says after bowing down before Daniel. He says, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. He doesn't here say, the only true God is Daniel's God. Not yet. In fact, the original is very clear that he says, your God is a God of gods. A God of gods. Not the God of gods. Not uh, the Lord of kings. But indefinite. Nebuchadnezzar here is still polytheistic. Um, There are still other gods. He says, your God is a Lord of kings. Uh, There are others. I mean, there are other regional deities who must be in charge of other kings somewhere. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's favorite was Marduk, and Marduk's son, Nebo, um, was the one Nebuchadnezzar was named after. Nebo, in particular, was said to be the, the one who revealed knowledge in Babylonian mythology. And so here, Nebuchadnezzar has to make this tacit admission <laughs> that Daniel's God is the revealer of mysteries in this case. This is a big admission, but it's not yet faith and repentance. Nebuchadnezzar here is not converted. But secondly, the king promotes the slave captives to positions of power, verse 48. The king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts. Literally, he gave him many much gifts of greatness, multiplied adjectives to describe his enrichment of Daniel here. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, that is probably the the city and its precincts, not ruler over the whole Babylonian empire, but Babylonia proper, uh, its capital center, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. 
So now Daniel is in charge of all those guys under whom and with whom he trained. Verse 49, Daniel didn't forget his friends. He made requests to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. That's gonna set us up for the next scene in chapter three when the three friends are out there in the province and, and, and Daniel isn't with them. How will they respond to trials? How has Daniel's leadership and encouragement prepared them for what they would face in chapter three? Daniel is probably not yet 20 years old and everything has reversed. The tables have turned. But this is about the sovereignty of God, his meticulous sovereignty over all empires and all kings of all time and over the details of human history. This is not the rags to riches story of Daniel. This is the filthy rags of man's corrupt rule of the earth will one day be exchanged for the glorious, unassailable, unending, uncorrupt, and incorruptible riches of the reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. That is the true exchange that this passage is about. Let me give us some considerations to think of this evening, even before we get into the rule of Christ next week. Do you pray what Jesus told his disciples to pray? Thy kingdom come. Is that in your heart and on your lips? Do you wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, come back? Do you go on and pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? That is an admission from a disciple that there is a tension. That the world is not what it should be yet. But it will be what it should be when the Lord has his day and when Jesus reigns on the earth. There is anticipation for us in there, a sanctified restlessness, a heavenly homesickness. Second consideration, where is your hope? If your hope is in human government, I hope we just spoiled it. Maybe the next election cycle. How has man's day gone so far? Sinful man trying his hand at ruling the earth? Adam failed. Very early on in Genesis 4, you have the creation of settlement and industry and society, and they amass themselves in rebellion against God. There is polygamy, vengeance, violence, and murder. Genesis 6, 5, the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Then you have the flood, and then you come to Genesis 10 and the, the table of nations, and you have societies and kingdoms, and you come very quickly to Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and his establishment of the city of Babel in the plains of Shinar. And it was said of Nimrod that his wife, after his death, created the cult of Nimrod, a religion around Nimrod. He was revered in his life, and he was worshipped after his death. And the cult of Nimrod resulted in the, the worship of a female deity who is said to be mother of God. Uh, that should strike some familiar tones for us throughout world history. That wickedness was repeated. It could be said that Nimrod's cult was the beginning of idolatry right there in Babel in the plains of Shinar. You have, of course, built there in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, open collective societal rebellion against God. God, you tried to flood us out. We're going to build up. We're going to make our way to heaven. In Genesis 12, God calls a special people. And you have the beginnings of a theocracy. God would be king manifested in his care for and rule of a special selected out people. And in the patriarchs, that people was initiated. In Egypt, they were incubated. Then in slavery in Egypt, they were subjugated. Through the Exodus, they were liberated. In the giving of the law at Sinai, they were incorporated with constitution and covenant. Then they were regulated through Mosaic law, and then I couldn't rhyme anything else. And you have the conquest and the judges, the kings of Saul, David, and Solomon, and then the divided kingdom, and then the exile. And then what you have from that point on for the rest of human history until Christ come back is the times of the Gentiles. Theocracy is over. And of course, God rules in the heavens, but he lets man have his way on the earth with his try at governance. We ought to have a pessimistic view of history and not misplace our hope. 
Men will try various forms of government, some better than others, but all of sinful humanity's lordship must be confiscated and replaced. The final version of man's governance is unrestrained satanic despotism. That's where the world is headed. The millennial kingdom of Christ is the end of human achievement. The day of Yahweh, when man's day is done, it is the beginning of the golden age for humanity. After the worst period ever, it will be the best period yet, leading into the eternal state. Listen, only Christ can bring together people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people and make them cohesive, make them adhere. Think about the church as a preview of that very reality. The church ought to be that. And where the church is functioning properly, it is that. Only Christ can do these things. Christ's coming kingdom, when compared to sinful man's attempts at lordship, is similar to the gospel itself. Sinful man tries and fails. Be all that you can be, only ends up in filthy rags and condemnation. And where man fails, God does. And the irony is when sinful man stops attempting from his sinful resources to do the things that only God can do, man flourishes. In the gospel, man flourishes when he gives up meritorious works and believes in the finished work of Christ. And human government and human populations will flourish when Jesus Christ, the God-man, reigns on the earth. And redeemed humanity will truly be sub-regents, lords of the earth, kings in God's created order. Third consideration this evening and a final one. What does exposure to truth produce in your heart? What does exposure to truth produce in your heart? Nebuchadnezzar here was given truth, glorious truth, unassailable truth. Daniel obviously was able to know Nebuchadnezzar's thoughts in his bedroom. He was able to know Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He was able to give the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream because God had delivered all these things through the prophet. Nebuchadnezzar could not deny that the God of heaven, Daniel's God, had spoken and revealed that he actually existed and he had power, he had knowledge. But Nebuchadnezzar's heart was not humbled. What about you? Can you come to knowledge and exposure to truth and still be short of true faith? One writer said this of Nebuchadnezzar, he had no heart for Daniel's God, even though he acknowledged the source of Daniel's wisdom. And people recognize that Jesus exists or he's a great guy or the Bible has some really good things to say. (laughs) That is far short of what is required of us. Religious experience can produce a significant but superficial response without depth, without real change. Nebuchadnezzar clearly admitted that he had encountered Daniel's God. But for Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel's God was one more deity to put on the shelf, one more experience to add to his collection. What about you this evening? Have you surrendered totally and completely to the God who is coming? To the one who will establish his kingdom in judgment and in glory and in grace for all those who believe? Next week, we'll work through that kingdom in verses 44 and 45, and we'll also work through the implications for eschatology, for end times beliefs and systems. What does Daniel 2 have to say about various approaches to reading our Bibles? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this dream. Thank you for its interpretation. Thank you for the truth that it reveals that the way things are now are not the way they are supposed to be, but you are driving all of history. It is your story, and you are bringing it to one glorious end when the monument of human achievement is smashed to powder, blown away by a summer breeze. And when you, our Lord, our Messiah, Jesus the Christ, reign on the earth, when you have your day, when you rule the nations with a rod of iron, 
when you give gifts to men. Lord, we're so thankful that you rule history. We pray that we would have a holy anticipation for those days to come and to live accordingly. We ask it in Jesus' name.